This is the Hôtel Dieu in Quebec City. Although today it's a secular hospital, it was founded in the 17th century by Augustinian nuns who have a monastery right next door. The existence of this hospital and several similar ones throughout the Americas and Europe points to a phenomenon of connection between Christianity and medicine. Religion and medicine have always been quite strongly connected, as we saw in the previous episode, and this was no exception for Christianity. By late antiquity, Christianity was the dominant religion in the Roman Empire, and after the Western Empire's fall, the church remained a strong institution in the medieval West. So, let's take a look at how medicine and religion developed side by side as we enter into the Middle Ages. By the end of antiquity, the shift towards Christianity didn't bring big fundamental changes towards medical theory. The biggest impact was in ethics, where the Christian emphasis on charity and Christ's role as a healer reinforced the idea that physicians should be good people, and further brought into practice the idea which Galen himself promoted, that a doctor shouldn't be greedy and instead should ideally charge nothing, especially when healing the poor. This led to the development of the Xenodokeion, especially in the eastern half of the empire, which were usually small hostels connected to churches where, amongst other things, the poor sick could receive treatment. After the fall of the Western Empire in the 5th century CE, developments continued in the Eastern or Byzantine Empire, including new ideas in pharmacology which built on and sometimes even challenged Dioscorides, and new developments in surgical procedures and tools, possibly thanks to occasional human dissections taking place. Nonetheless, medieval Byzantium didn't deviate much from the Galenism of late antiquity. The Latin West saw some bigger changes, however. As you'll recall, Greek remained the language of medical theory, and so, with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, as the Greek and Latin worlds became more separate, many of the untranslated theoretical works of Hippocrates and Galen were lost to the early medieval realms, which succeeded the empire. By contrast, practical and empirical works like Dioscorides, Celsus, and Pliny remained, alongside the Christian spiritual medicine which had developed in the empire and which had been coexisting alongside rational medicine, and, of course, also continued to exist in the Greek East. To these were added traditional and what we would call folk remedies from the Germanic and Celtic worlds, as these cultures became ingrained into Latin Christendom. Some aspects of medical theory were retained, however, including the basic tenets of humoral theory, largely through late antique translations of introductory texts like the Hippocratic Aphorisms and Galen's Therapeutics to Glaucon. Much of the early medieval knowledge of medical theory can be seen in Isidore Seville's 6th century encyclopedia called The Etymologies, which was widely read and had an entire book dedicated to medicine and the body. Theory also appears to have been put to use on occasion, with the 8th century Northumbrian bishop John of Beverley noting that observing the phase of the moon was important in determining when and from where one should bleed a patient. Nonetheless, the concern with medical theory seems to have been mostly out of intellectual curiosity and that which was preserved was merely the tip of the iceberg. Many manuscripts on practical medicine only had a limited interest in theory, if any at all. Most of this knowledge was preserved by clerics, who were often the most educated and literate members of early medieval society. This isn't to say that medicine was exclusively the purview of monks and priests, even when it came to classically inherited medicine, but they were by far the most involved, at least with the written stuff. Even most of what we know about folk medicine from this time comes from monasteries, where presumably monks either wrote down cures which they learned from the laity, or which they had learned from their own culture, often adding it into manuscripts which included classical texts. The aforementioned Christian sense of duty to help the less fortunate, the strong connection of Jesus and the saints' miracles to healing, as well as the sense that knowledge was valuable to understanding God's creation, made it so that medical knowledge was valued and there were many healers who were also clerics, with several monasteries containing clinics for healing both monks and laity. There were, especially in the early days, clerics who were suspicious of secular medicine and promoted prayer alone, but these were in the minority, and by the Middle Ages, medicine was seen as imbued with divine power, and it was considered a Christian art. Nonetheless, the philosophical medical tradition did flourish in another part of the world, the Islamicate world. 
With the Muslim conquest of parts of the Byzantine Empire, they incorporated many aspects of Greek culture and learning into their own intellectual circles, just as they did with Persian culture. This meant that many Greek texts were translated fairly early on into Arabic, especially in the 8th to 10th centuries in Baghdad, when this effort was the most heavily funded. Muslims, Christians, and Jews in the Islamic world were largely enthusiastic adopters of Galen, who they dubbed the physician, just as they were for Aristotle, who was known as the philosopher. But from their scholars, even more developments emerged than amongst the Byzantines. It would be impossible to talk about all of them in just this video, but there are a couple which I would like to touch upon. Many new diseases like smallpox and measles were first categorized at this time, and many new herbs and cures were added to translations of Dioscorides based on what was locally available. The same was true for surgery, and Abu al-Khazim al-Zarawi, known to the West as Abu Qasis, created an encyclopedia of surgical tools and procedures which would later become the fundamental manual for learned surgeons. Before him, the physician and philosopher al-Razi greatly developed ideas about the connection between mental state and health, arguing in On Spiritual Medicine that pursuing pure knowledge was a good way of staying healthy, in part by keeping one away from negative effects of greed, lust, envy, and the fear of death. One can't possibly talk about Islamic medicine, however, without mentioning Ibn Sina, known to the West as Avicenna, and Ibn Rushd, known to the West as Averroes. Ibn Sina is often considered one of the most significant figures in the Islamic Golden Age, and his contributions to medicine are nothing small. His most influential work is the Canon of Medicine, a fundamental work on all things related to health and the body based on Galen's On Medical Sects for Beginners. One of the significant developments in this book is how Ibn Sina divided diseases into two types, those which affect the whole body, like fevers, and those which affect a specific part, like cancers, with each requiring a different medical approach. Ibn Rushd is best known for his General Principles of Medicine, also known as the Collegiate, which became another influential encyclopedia of medicine, as well as his summaries and commentaries on Galen. Both of these authors and many others would include in their texts therapies which were passed down to them, along with new ones which they developed either through experience or reason, and their works would continue to teach future generations of physicians. Eventually, with intellectual shifts in the Latin West, scholars began to crave the theoretical knowledge which they knew they were missing. And, as wars and cultural exchange brought the Latin, Christian, and Islamic worlds closer together starting in the 11th century, they would have the opportunity to do so. The Hispanic conquests of Islamic Iberia, especially the conquest of Toledo in 1085, and the Norman conquests of Sicily from the 1060s to the 1090s, ushered in a new translation movement in those areas from Arabic into Latin, as well as into some vernacular languages, not only for medical texts, but also philosophical, astrological, and other texts as well. This was largely due to the fact that Christian kingdoms now had many Arabic-speaking subjects who could either make those translations or at least teach the language to other scholars, who were often funded by intellectually-minded monarchs or other elites. In terms of medical texts, the first translations into Latin were made by a man named Constantine the African, supposedly after having been shocked at the simplicity of Latin healing when he got sick when traveling to Salerno. Constantine would eventually become a monk at the famous monastery of Monte Cassino, and there he translated several medical works, mostly by Muslim authors. These were brought to Salerno, which had long been a place associated with medical learning due to the nearby hot springs which had long been used for healing and it encouraged more new translations. By the 12th century, Salernitan physicians who'd been using these translated texts developed a curriculum of core texts for teaching medicine called the Articella, or Ars Medica, based around Galenism. The Articella was originally composed of six texts, the Isagog of Hunayn ibn Ishaq, an introduction to the medicine of Galen, the Aphorisms and Prognostics of Hippocrates, the Ars Parva of Galen, a Byzantine work on pulses by Philaretus, and one on urine by Theophilus. The texts were taught in lectures, literally Latin for readings, and the Articella became the standard collection of works for medical education in the cathedral schools which developed further north, which would help bring about the so-called 12th century renaissance. 
In the 13th century, these cathedral schools developed into the first European universities, many of which established faculties of medicine alongside those of theology, law, and the liberal arts. As time went on, more texts were translated and added to the Articella, including Ibn Sina's Canon of Medicine. Overall, medieval medical education remained thoroughly Galenic, and scholastic debates amongst intellectuals surrounded, as they had in late antique and Islamic worlds, interpretations of Galen, as well as whether or not non-Galenic works and commentaries were acceptable within that medical worldview. Of course, there were still developments, as there were in those other contexts, and medieval Europeans wrote important books of their own. Arnau of Villanova was probably the most famous physician of his day, having served several popes and kings, and he wrote his fair share of books, including a treatise on how to take care of an army's medical needs while on campaign, the Regimen Almarie. He was educated at the University of Montpellier, which became renowned in the Middle Ages as the best in terms of medical education. By the late Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, Galen's influence also increased the popularity of anatomy. In universities, teachers of medicine would dissect animals as demonstrations to their students, following in Galen's own footsteps. Eventually, this led to human dissections as well, performed exclusively on executed criminals. This was accepted for two reasons. First of all, medieval scholars were under the mistaken impression that Galen himself had done this, and so they felt like his authority justified it. But also, the Christian idea of the body and soul being separate made it easier to accept, at least on criminals who they could be fairly certain would not be resurrected in the flesh on Judgment Day. That being said, human dissections still were rather rare events, and most medical students would only get to see them once or twice in their lives. Still, the increased focus on anatomy coincided with the reining in of surgery into the field of medicine. Most surgeons at the time continued to be craftsmen, who may have doubled as barbers, with both of these careers being related to the use of knives on the surface of the body. And they often performed operations at the behest of a physician. Nonetheless, some physicians began to focus on surgery and incorporated surgical intervention more strongly into medical theory. In some cities, surgical colleges were formed separate from barber guilds, and their members prided themselves on learning from books, such as the aforementioned Manual of Albucasis, as well as other later Christian texts, which they saw as distinguishing themselves from the empiric barber surgeons. This distinction speaks to the continued existence at the time of the so-called medical marketplace, with various groups of healers competing for legitimacy. One benefit of universities was that they provided diplomas, which guaranteed one's education, and most people saw those with diplomas as the best healers available. Even so, others were still sought out for a variety of reasons, including cost, availability, or even personal preference. In terms of availability, it should be kept in mind that many universities with medical faculties saw only a handful of graduates per decade, sometimes averaging fewer than one per year. And those living outside of cities might only see a traveling physician on rare occasions, if ever. Some medical texts were eventually translated into vernacular languages allowing people without a university education to obtain a certain degree of medical learning. Some of these people, both male and female, used this knowledge to practice as healers themselves as an alternative to university physicians. This did occasionally get them into trouble, however, especially as some cities and states began issuing medical licenses. But this class of healer was still widespread and practiced alongside empirics and folk healers, with some, even women, receiving licenses to practice. Jewish healers were also a popular alternative, due to the fact that they were often quite learned, with many having their own Hebrew translations of texts in the Galenic tradition, or having learned in the Islamic world, but overall being less expensive than university physicians. Universities were Christian institutions, with many requiring clerical vows to enter, which meant that Jews were not eligible unless they converted. Despite this, and the occasional legislation against visiting Jewish healers, civic authorities did occasionally license them as well. The later Middle Ages also saw the growth and popularization of hospitals. Like the Byzantine Xenodokea before them, these were for more than just healing. They were for all the, quote, poor, including the sick, the impoverished, the down on their luck, the elderly, pilgrims, and the mentally infirm. They were hospitals as much as they were hotels and hostels. In fact, all of these names come from the same Latin term, hospitale which comes from hospitalitas, hospitality.
many of these hospitals were simple boarding houses without any professional healers whatsoever, though they usually had a few people who knew some healing, especially since most of them were religious institutions. This is one of the reasons why Jerusalem had some of the largest hospitals, as they were meant to house many pilgrims who couldn't afford other accommodations, and they were often the recipients of charitable donations. Some hospitals did hire full-time healers, however, be they university trained or not, and others had some come by from time to time, possibly as charity work. That being said, Galenic medicine was more focused on acute conditions, whereas those who were sick in hospitals tended to be suffering from chronic diseases which couldn't be cured, which meant that they needed help and relief for a long period of time. By the 1300s, hospitals focused especially on the sick did become more and more common, especially as some secular hospitals were established in cities, but they usually still remained focused on chronic illness and the sick poor. To end the video, and in anticipation of the next one, I want to talk a little bit about the Black Death. The Black Death ravaged Europe in the late Middle Ages, first appearing as a pandemic in the 1340s before becoming endemic, causing waves of epidemic up until the 17th century. The initial pandemic killed somewhere between a third and half of all people in Christian Europe, and traumatized those who lived through it. Its scale was something never before seen, and intellectuals were stricken by the fact that ancient authorities never mentioned anything quite like it. Epidemics, according to Galen and Hippocrates, were inherently local, caused by local heirs. How could one possibly affect the whole world? Eventually, a universal cause was largely agreed upon, that of the stars. Now, I don't have time to go too in-depth about medieval views of astrology, that deserves its own future video, but in the end, it was associated with a conjunction of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn in Aquarius, which had taken place a few years prior. This conjunction had caused putrefaction in the airs all over the world. Although this was an explanation for the plague which largely fit within Galenic theory, the fact that medical writers were forced to encounter something new, which the ancient authorities had not known about, would start to contribute to the ways in which views on ancient authority itself would shift in the coming centuries. But that will have to wait until next time. And that's going to be about it for today's episode. If you enjoyed it, I hope that you'll leave it a like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like this. I've got plenty of ideas of future videos to come, so you can stay tuned for more. You can also uh, share it with your friends to help the channel grow and leave a comment of any ideas you might have for future videos. Other than that, I guess I'll see you guys next time.